Welcome to Can I Park Here, brought to you by findafashiontruck.com. Nashe and Estrell's mission is to inspire future and existing small business owners. They don't claim to be experts. They're simply trying to figure this all out, just like you. Hello, welcome to Can I Park Here. I am your co-host, Estrell Riles, and I'm here with... Nashe Snow. Today, we'll be speaking with Nate DeMars of Pursuits in Columbus, Ohio. Pursuit is a suit clothing store for men. We really think that you're going to enjoy this episode today. We surely did with Nate. He does um, a great job of taking us through the last five years of his business. He started out with a business plan and had an end goal of starting his own suit line. And he takes us through like kind of what the five years all entailed, which included like going from a pop-up shop to a brick and mortar to starting the suit mobile and to now having his own line of suits. So a very fascinating story and we think you'll enjoy it. Here we go. Hello and welcome to another episode of Can I Park Here? Today we have Nate Dumars from Pursuit. Welcome, Nate. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I can't wait to get into your story. Um, I was just looking through your website and all your social media accounts. So it seems like you've been very successful with your fashion truck. So I think uh, I'm sure you're going to have like a lot of helpful and useful tips for other fashion trucks. So we're excited about this. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Can you tell us just a little bit about your background leading up to the fashion truck and um, just a little bit about the fashion truck, like the brand that you've created? Sure. So uh, Pursuit started first in 2011 as a uh, as a brick and mortar retail store in sort of a uh, a pop up short term setup. Uh, so originally Pursuit was a, a class project. It was an idea that came to me while I was at uh, Ohio State in the MBA program, and the idea was to come up with a a better way for a new generation of guys to buy suits. We kind of felt like a lot of guys were stuck going to the mall and shopping at the same stores that their dads were shopping at. And none of those stores were really catering to this new generation of guys who all needed suits for job interviews and and work and weddings and things of that nature. So I think maybe what's a little bit unique about how we got to the fashion truck component is that we had operated as a a brick and mortar store, our our initial pop-up store, in Columbus had become a, a permanent fixture. So a pop-up store that just kind of never ended. And then mm-hmm. store number two, I guess you could call it, was what we call our suit mobile. So um, I, I think sometimes maybe it's the other way around where people test concepts with a truck and we actually added a truck to a brick and mortar business. I'm actually really excited to have you on the podcast because it seems like the fashion truck industry is mostly dominated by women. And it's awesome to see that men are getting into this as well. And I think it's just, it's great. You know, I look at your, your truck and it's freaking awesome. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So do you mind um, sharing how much uh, went into establishing your fashion truck as a business? Like what steps did you have to go through? Sure. So I I think from the beginning, when we launched the company in 2011, uh, a component of our business was always intended to be the university market. And with universities being a very seasonal retail business, we always kind of had an idea we wanted to do something truly mobile, like, like a truck. Uh, So it was a very long process because it was kind of always in the back of, of our minds that, that we were going to do something like this someday. So I probably looked at, uh, no joke, over a thousand step vans on, Craig, on Craigslist or any other site that I could find online for years. Uh, and it really wasn't until uh, I think it was late in 2013 in the fall when we really decided that it was time to, to get serious about doing it as a project. So there was a, there was a lot of kind of kicking around the idea and searching for a vehicle. Um, but the, the first and most time consuming step was definitely figuring out what type of vehicle was going to be right for us. And then finding the actual, uh, 
vehicle that that would become the the store mm. and it was a long long process and a lot of that i think maybe uh it, it was maybe more important for us because of what we sell so if we were selling t-shirts or accessories or things like that the product wouldn't be so large and bulky it wouldn't be so critical to the process to try it on but we really had to figure out what was the best way to sell a suit which is about as large of a of a, an apparel item as you're going to sell. Uh, so we, we spent a lot of time really trying to hone in on what vehicle was going to be the best bet and then weighing that uh, versus versus the cost of, of the different options. So once once we had determined, you know, we had, we had looked around at a lot of options and we knew that uh, as cool as it would be to buy a, a tour bus or an RV or something like that, that was probably not going to be feasible from a, a budget standpoint wasn't going to be feasible from from a parking standpoint for a lot of the places we wanted to go so we f- we thought the biggest most flexible option for us would be a, a step van um, or for those that maybe aren't familiar with the term like i wasn't it's basically like a ups or a fedex truck or what what most folks uh, associate with a taco truck or a food truck it's the the big boxy square looking uh, truck <laughs> so so that process took quite a while and finally we uh when we decided that's the type of vehicle we wanted and we got more serious about finding the specific uh unit that was right for us we found a a dealer uh we're in columbus ohio we found a dealer about halfway between columbus and cincinnati so less than an hour away that had a whole bunch of these things uh sitting used for resale and we actually ended up buying what used to be a cape cod potato chip truck (laughs) turning it into a traveling suit store. So uh, I usually like to tell people that, that our, our other store is a potato chip truck. (laughs) Did you do any of the work yourself or did you hire a professional for the build out? So we're not, uh, we're not the most handy when it comes to, uh, when it comes to building things, uh, thankfully I have some really good help in the creative department. So, uh, my good friend Shay, who, who went to graduate school with me at Ohio state, he's been involved in pursuit from nearly the beginning. And mm. he, he has a, a graphic design background. So he was able to design a lot of like the exterior of the truck, which is, uh, we think pretty unique uh, and, and very bold. He, uh, he actually designed all of that and the inside of the truck was designed by an architect because we knew that creating a suit store inside of a little box like that, we really needed to get it right and utilize the space. So we didn't actually do much of the physical construction. Um, some of the conceptual design and the, and the kind of art design was done in house. Um, but then the architect subcontracted some of the work to, to make the product displays and to try to turn that, uh, that box into what we think is is the world's most unique suit store. For the listeners out there, I would definitely head on over to PursuitYourself.com. And in the navigation, there's a link called Suit Mobile. And you can see the inside of the truck, which is fabulous because it's like you're walking into a suit store. I mean, you have like a place where people can change, like everything is laid out exactly um, like you would see it in a suit store. You have kind of like the lighting that's kind of shining on the suits off to the right. And then, yeah, I just think whoever the architect was did a fabulous job of making it feel like you're kind of like going into, you know, a, a suit store that's a brick and mortar. So kudos to you. Yeah, and that that was thank you. That that was the goal. Was um, we wanted it to to be a miniature version, but a fully functional version of our brick and mortar store. And and honestly, I, I have a lot of friends who are in the boutique world and own clothing stores. Uh, people who I've become friends with since I got into this here in Columbus, and a lot of them are a lot more handy than handier than I am. Um, so I, I think certain people with certain skill sets definitely can do some things themselves, but the combination of me not being very skilled in that sort of thing. And also the fact that we're selling, you know, a relatively expensive product that is large and needs to be tried on those factors kind of made us uh, go the route of hiring a professional design team and, and going to uh, maybe a little more elaborate with it. But um we thought that was important for pulling it off in the way that would work for us. Um, there, there's a few other folks we know with clothing trucks who 
took a little more DIY approach and, and did just fine with it too. So I don't think our way is the only way to do it, but it was probably the only way for us to do uh, our concept at least. Mm-hmm. And, and I see too, you know, we've interviewed people who've done everything themselves and then people who've like paid like professional designers or architects to do it. So I do feel like it depends one on your comfort level and then just two, what's in your budget. You know, sure. and then from there, like even if you have to start out with kind of more of a DIY, you could always kind of build up and save your money to to pay for a designer or architect later. Yeah, and for us, you know, that we we looked around and saw some of the national clothing brands when we would go to trade shows. I think maybe the the earliest inspiration came from seeing uh, going to Magic, the large uh, fashion trade show out in Vegas, and seeing some of the brands who had really cool, almost like mobile merchandise, mobile marketing vehicles. Um, but it, it wasn't, uh, we quickly found out it wasn't really realistic for us to look at something that maybe Tommy Hilfiger did and <laughs> think that we could you know, have the budget to, to do something along, you know, to, to, to buy a vintage uh tour bus or something like that just wasn't uh wasn't a very practical you know for for them it's more of a marketing expense for us it needs to be a a uh profitable venture so uh we we had to uh kind of adjust our project accordingly Mm. now do you sell um accessories in addition to the the full suits like um shirts, ties, socks, that type of thing or is it only packaged custom items? No, we we sell primarily off the rack suits, so we're we're focused on uh slim fitting modern suits. So we try to we try to take uh what a guy may look for at a men's warehouse or a Macy's and filter out 90% of the choices that you'd see at a place like that, just down to what we think are the, the stylish, reasonably priced, great fitting options. Uh, so we, we sell those off the rack suits. And then with that, um, and the rest of the professional attire, a guy would need to round out the look. So uh, dress shirts, ties, bow ties, um, and, and limited accessories, pocket squares, socks, things of that nature. Um, but, but we try to be primarily a professional, a suit store more than anything. And we don't really dabble much into business casual or even casual attire. Mm. Now, what, what distinguishes your, your store from the regular department stores and the suit warehouses? Like, are sure. you comparable with, prices or are you trying to be lower than them so you can get more business how do you figure out your pricing well, i think from the beginning what's what's always been uh, the most unique about us is is the uh, and i actually i hate this word and i hate that i'm using it but i think it it uh, mm-hmm. delivers the point uh, that that we curate that we narrow the assortment uh as much as any store does. So we typically, when you walk into our regular brick and mortar store, we may have somewhere in the neighborhood of eight suits from you to, for you to choose from. So if you mm. walk in and tell us you want a blue suit, we may have two or three options for you to look at. And it doesn't take more than two minutes of trying on a couple coats to decide which of those two or three that you like the best. So we try to make the process as, as simple as possible guys we find uh, don't often know a ton about suits they don't buy them frequently and they want limited choices to make it as easy as possible so we've kind of cut out all the clutter Uh, we only sell at the moment two button suits Uh, we've never sold pants that have pleats all our suits then are also we try to be uh, certainly not the cheapest suit you'd ever buy but we think the the best value. So our suits are typically two forty nine to three ninety nine, mm. which would be uh, kind of the low to mid price range at both a Macy's and Men's Warehouse. So we're we're definitely not a boutique in that sense. We don't sell um, luxury lines or expensive products. We try to sell something that's a little more accessible to the average young guy. Mm. And then the the key thing on top of that that I think is is the most important is just that you get um, 
And you you had mentioned that there's not as many guys focused businesses doing this. Uh, this is this is something that that we think is kind of a, a growing trend or a coming back trend. Is just the the old fashioned service that used to be a staple of of menswear stores that kind of fell by the wayside after years and years of of local men's stores going out of business and being replaced by kind of big box type stores or mall stores. Mm -hmm. So we try to offer that, that uh, you can come in and buy a suit for $300 and get the amount of face time and expertise and kind of approachable advice that you would get when you were, when you were buying a $1,500 suit from a custom clothier or something like that. So we think that the customer service component is something that's been kind of lost outside of the luxury world in menswear for quite some time. And uh, we, we make it really easy. And then we give the guys all that advice and service that they need. And we can do that on the truck as well. No, that's awesome. And then you mentioned earlier, like the magic trade show. Um, but we often hear from fashion trucks, uh, like the question, like, how do I find the right vendors? So what's been your experience? Are you going to mostly like the larger trade shows? Do um, you purchase from local local vendors? Like what has been your experience? And did you have any advice for other kind of fashion trucks who are trying to figure out like how to navigate themselves through like the vendor world? Sure. Yeah, that, that certainly is a challenge when you're small, especially. And I, I didn't have any background in fashion or retail when I got into this. I was pretty naive to the whole industry. Um, so our, our end goal from the day we wrote the business plan has always been that, that we want to sell Pursuit branded clothing. And uh, I found out pretty quickly four years ago when we were just getting started or, or trying to get started that uh, to launch as a reasonably priced one location men's store with your own brand of suits is a pretty uh, difficult proposition. The <laughs> economies of scale of that just don't uh, work out very well, especially when you don't have any inside connections in the industry. So, so we've been buying from uh, wholesale. We've been buying wholesale from major manufacturers mostly for our uh, three years, three and a half years of existence. And that's typically come from going uh, to, trade shows. Usually we go to um, Chicago Collective, which is a, a menswear specific show that is a little more focused on what we do. Occasionally we'll go to um, Magic or Project in New York or in Las Vegas because there's just so much more there and, and that might be a way to meet some up and coming designers or to expand the product line a little bit and find things that, that maybe uh, we wouldn't see at a smaller show in Chicago. Mm. Um, so, so we've gone that route. We've bought wholesale. Um, and for us to be always under $400 with our suits, uh, a lot of the times, and also being stylish and slim fit and all the things we need them to be, uh, we've sold brands like Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger and DKNY over, over our three and a half years. Um, and we're just now at a point where uh, in the next month or so, we'll start rolling out the first phase of, of Pursuit branded products. But it took us quite some time and, and a whole lot of learning to get <clears throat> to the point where we were ready to, to start making our own products and, and putting our label on things. How many suits do you recommend a man should have? And how important is it to have at least one suit? Sure. Well, and I, I, I think um, f the the trend for quite some time is that there's far less professions where guys are wearing a suit to work as there would have been 40, 50 years ago for sure. And, and maybe even, maybe even uh, our parents' generation wore suits to work more often than the current generation. Um, but we still feel like every guy has things that come up throughout the course of a year where they need a suit. Um, so maybe guys aren't, aren't, uh, having a closet full and one of everything, but we recommend for every guy to, to start out with the first suit being, uh, a, a well-fitted, very timeless, either charcoal gray or Navy blue suit. And we feel like most guys, especially if you're uh, in the professional world where, uh, there's going to be excuses for you to dress up every now and again, if not all the time. You probably need those two suits at least to start with, uh, and they're the most versatile. You can wear them all year round. And a lot of our business, uh, and we've got a lot of repeat customers who are, our location right now is at Ohio State on campus. Uh, so we have a lot of young attorneys or people in the law school. We've got 
uh, people who are going into the finance world or who are very involved in maybe the nonprofit world where they're going to a lot of fundraisers and events. And those people are probably wearing suits four or five days a week and and then they need to have a couple shades of gray and a black and and a few blues. Mm -hmm. Um, But we try to be the place that that guy that doesn't own any suits or only owns one can feel comfortable walking in. And also a place where the guy who who maybe has a little more established taste can come in and find a few things that are that are different or more interesting too. So, um, so that's a long winded answer to say <laughs> we think every guy probably should have at least one. And if you're just going to have one, you probably should should grab a, a charcoal gray suit. Um, we think most guys could probably find an excuse to have at least two, and then you'd have uh, you'd go to a two part job interview, or or you could go out of town for a wedding and wear something different both days. Um, and if you want to have more than that, then we love you because you're coming in more regularly for <laughs> for multiple suits. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's interesting how your brand has evolved. Like you said, you started with kind of a pop up, and then it turned into pretty much like a brick and mortar, and then um, the you know you expanded into the suit mobile. And then now you're about to launch your kind of like own brand of suits. So it feels like you're just continuing to expand. So that must be an awesome feeling. Yeah, it's Uh, exciting. Uh, Things don't often happen as quickly as you'd like them to. And sometimes uh, they don't happen like you had planned them out. But uh, it's, it's, it's fun to feel like some of the things that, you know, that we had hoped to do from the beginning are, we're at a stage now where we can, can start to dive in deeper and and have a little more control over how we do business. Oh yeah. Now with your um brick and mortar and then also the truck, another question we often get is point of sale systems. So do you have like a point of sale system that is connected so if you sell something in the truck it automatically kind of updates like one database and that database is also connected to whatever you use in the store or do you com- do you keep the inventory for both of the places, the truck and the brick and mortar, completely separate? Yeah, that that was one of the initial challenges we had to get through. Um, things, the the way we actually evolved, uh, we started with just the brick and mortar. About a year and a half in, maybe two years in, we added an online store, um, which is not uh, at the moment is not the majority of our business, but it is. Uh, it was the second kind of channel that we added, and then we added the truck on top of that. Um, so one of the early struggles with the truck was coming up with a system where we could, uh, we knew which, what inventory was on the truck and, and, uh, we, we could track things kind of in two places at once because we we're small enough that we can't afford to have, uh, a massive amount of inventory and just dedicate some of it to the truck and some of it to the store. Um, we've gotten to a point now where we use, um, we're actually just, the, the final component we're switching our website over to be based on shopify uh, mm. but shopify is the point of sale system that we use in the store and now this season also that the, it's the system we use in the truck and then seamlessly it'll be uh we'll, we're relaunching our website in july and and that'll be on the shopify platform as well so uh, in the past, we've been using uh, a Magento website with a point of sale called Vend, and, and they were both fine, but there was uh, kind of a layer of communication between the two to keep the inventory up to date. So now we're going to you know, a streamlined single system that will that will cover all three of those outlets, the store, the, the truck, and the website. Awesome. So does Shopify have like an app kind of similar to Square and some of the the other uh, competitors out there where you could just ring up, you know, your, the merchandise in the truck from the Shopify app? Yep. So we use, oh, uh, wow. we've always used, actually we launched with Square. So our first 15 months or so when we were only brick and mortar, no website, we used Square and we've always used the iPad as kind of our, our terminal. Um, so now with, with Shopify, uh, there's a pretty clean, intuitive point of sale app. Um, I've got one of the obnoxious uh, iPhone six <laughs> pluses that's basically like an iPad. <laughs> so when we've been out on the truck early this year, I've I haven't even brought an iPad. I've just been ringing people up on my iPhone, um, and it's it's a 
you know, we, we launched three and a half years ago now, and it was cool to think then that you know, it was novel to people that they'd come in and we'd swipe their card on an iPad. Um, and I think it's evolved quite a bit now. People don't seem so surprised by it anymore. It's, it's, uh, something that you see when you go to a restaurant and, uh, yeah. everybody who takes credit card for anything seems to have, uh, a square reader or something like that. And Shopify is, is kind of a, maybe slightly more, um, functional or slightly more elaborate uh, setup than square but very much along the same lines no i think it is and um well total side note because astro laughs at my iphone 6 plus (laughs) 2 however (laughs) however i swear when i look at people with iphone 4 and 5 and even a 6 i'm like this is so small how do you guys even see anything on it it's like it completely changes your world it does doesn't it i mean so i'm so happy with my phablet take that astro (laughs) nobody cares (laughs) But um, I think the Shopify is, that's good to know because um, I don't know how long they had an app, but I always knew that they had like the online store and the online store seems, you know, fairly simple to set up. And then of course you can um, pay a developer to do, you know, something more sophisticated if you're not a developer. Um, But I think this will give people a good place to start. And even um, people might be on Shopify right now and just not even realize that they have an app that they can also use in a truck. So I think that'll be um, really useful. So thanks for that. Yeah, it's been, we switched the point of sale system over first and it's been about three months and and uh, we've had nothing but but good luck with it so far. So we're pretty excited. Cool. Have you had to um, have any legal issues or in regards to parking? Like what is the situation in Columbus as far as the regulations for fashion trucks? Uh, Columbus is um, pretty progressive about food trucks. They haven't really yet um, done anything in a significant way for uh, fashion trucks specifically um we in columbus we need um i'm blanking on the name of it it's a um oh it's a peddler's permit i believe it's called so it's the same kind of uh, license that you would need to go uh, door-to-door selling products um so it's actually a process you you have to go down to the city and and go through a background check and um you get a little uh, ID card basically that you're supposed to keep with you, but that's, um, that's kind of the extent of, of the licenses that you need. And then, uh, the parking situation, uh, in Columbus, there's a handful of dedicated, uh, spaces that are for food trucks only. Um, and we've actually never used them as a clothing truck, although I believe we could, uh, most of what we do is, is either on private property or it's at a an event of some sort where uh, the organizers are paying to uh, bag off meters. So that like there's a monthly event we do downtown in Columbus, and the organizers um, make all the arrangements for us to bag the meters, and then we can just park on the city street um, with that with that permit. But um, we were we were kind of concerned about that. I'm always concerned that I'm breaking rules that I don't know about whenever I do anything <laughs> with my business. Uh, so I was a little paranoid about all that, and it was. It, we I think I ended up paying something like 150 dollars for this uh, peddler's permit, and it needs to be renewed annually uh, for a lesser fee, I think. But um, we haven't we haven't had any headaches with that, um, and we've done quite a few things on private property. And, and, uh, when we do that, um, whether we're in the driveway at a fraternity house or we're in the parking lot, um, at a a business where, you know, the, the retail store or the restaurant owns the lot uh, and we're on private property, uh, it's, it's no problem at all. And honestly, we've never, we've never had any hassle. I've never actually had anybody ask me to see that permit. Uh, nobody's ever given us a hard time about it. So, um, Columbus is a pretty forward thinking place in general. So I, I think maybe we're less likely to get hassled, but, uh, we, we've had nothing but good luck with that too. When you're parking on private property at the local businesses, how do you go about getting their permission? Is it something where they ask you to come and park there or do you have to kind of give them a little pitch to convince them to let you set up shop? Uh, so, so most mostly people are asking us to come, and it tends to be 
um, it, it tends to be kind of complementary businesses who are doing some kind of event and, and we're almost kind of a, you know, almost a novelty or an additional um, kind of piece of excitement to add to it. Um, we, and we have partnered with people where we've gone to them and, and gotten permission to, to park on, on their property. Typically people are pretty receptive and, and I think some of that might just be how unique it is. Um, whereas maybe the food truck folks, there's more competition and, and, uh, it's not quite as new and novel of a thing. Um, at the moment, I think there's, there's two of us in Columbus who have clothing trucks and maybe another three clothing trailers that are you know, kind of similar setups, just, you know, pull behind units. So there's, uh, there's enough of us to, to do events, but there's not enough of us that it's kind of been overkilled yet. So, mm. um, so people have been pretty receptive. Um, and yeah, we, we honestly, we don't, uh, you know, having the store, we don't operate the truck as if it is a full-time store. We actually use it fairly sparingly, um, at the moment, just because we've got our hands full with, with the brick and mortar store as well. So, uh, it may be different if I was out trying to, to have it in operation every day, but right now it's more so, uh, weekend events that, that people are inviting us to. Now, this is a total side note, and I know you've been operating for several years now, um, but I was looking at your, you know, social media accounts and you're doing, you know, awesome. But I had to do like a double check at your Facebook because I was like, wow, 10,000 people. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. so uh, do you have like any advice out there for um, especially like the newer fashion trucks that are trying to build an audience? Like, um, was it kind of like just really gradually over time or um you know, did you do anything specific like giveaways or whatever to really help build that audience? Like anything you could, you know, offer to kind of help people out? Yeah, I think when we first launched, um, the social media landscape was slightly different and, and Facebook was really probably the most key component to us uh, getting noticed. And I, I think things have changed a little bit. Um, you know, our, our store is on campus. Ohio State's the third largest university in the country. It's almost like a city in and of itself. <laughs> so when we launched in 2011, um, you know, we were marketing primarily to college students. And Facebook was, was you know, I think, still the coolest way to reach students. Uh, Instagram has become a lot more popular. Snapchat amongst the students is is kind of the hottest social media at the moment. Uh, but I think a lot of our following came from the fact that we were fairly savvy with Facebook in the early days, and that was the best way to reach students. Um, and Shay, who I mentioned before with with the uh, design background, I think has always been able to to create content that makes us look a little more polished and a little more advanced as a business than maybe we really are or were at the time. Um, so whether that's kind of cool looking educational infographics about how to wear a tie clip or it's uh you know just promotional things about whatever's going on in the store that i think helped us grab a following early um and facebook was really where we put most of our marketing effort that's really the only place we've spent advertising dollars to this point um, mm -hmm. so we've had ten thousand facebook fans for probably two years now and and we've decided to, st to stop investing as much into that um just because we're not we're not seeing the same return out of it as as we have in the past, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I think we have a you know our, our marketing strategy is very much social media and, and word of mouth, and um, you know we try we try to create interesting content that that you know, allows us to connect more emotionally with with our customers too. So we do a ton of videos. We've had uh, huge success with with YouTube kind of educational content. So you know, I think we're, we're trying to be a modern suit store and the comparisons, the other people that um, we're competing against are, um, there are a lot of things that we're not and they're better at us than us at so many things, um, <laughs> but we can be cooler and more uh, in tune with what's going on with a younger audience because that's primarily all we serve. Mm-hmm. No, oh, yeah, great, great job, and and all of your photographs are look like they've been professionally taken too, so I feel like that kind of adds to your brand. There's like this kind of like slickness and sophistication to it, um, so yeah, it just I, I think probably like draws people in. 
Yeah, and I think for us, when we're selling, you know, we're not selling the most expensive suit, but we're still selling a suit, which is, you know, a, a fairly sizable chunk of money and probably the most expensive piece of clothing a guy is going to own. So, you know, I think I think we feel a little more pressure to to put a little extra polish on our content too, just because, um, in our case, there's a lot of uh, moms and dads involved in the purchase decision, mm-hmm. and. Most of the time, they've never heard of us. So uh, we we need when when uh, their son sends them a link or tells them that he wants to shop with us, uh, we got to be cool enough in our marketing that that the son knows he's buying from the right place and that we can relate to him. But we got to be polished enough that mom doesn't mind approving the credit card purchase. So <laughs> right. Uh, so we have. We, we have to be a little bit grown up and polished just for that very reason. <laughs> What are some of the lessons you've learned with regards to being a small business owner? Well, I, I think uh, we really, in the early days, uh, we latched onto the idea that every guy needs a suit and there was a huge void in the market nationally for a, a, a place that uh, caters to a, this new generation of guys. And we were really excited about coming up with the concept and what that meant from a merchandise standpoint and from a marketing standpoint. Um, and, you know, I think some of the surprises of being a small business owner or maybe not even surprises, but things that you can't appreciate until you live through it is just how much work goes into operating a store, you know, a simple little 900 square foot store or a, <laughs> a, a 150 square foot suit mobile. Um, just getting the customer service right, getting the merchandise right. There's just a lot of operational things that go into doing that well. And uh, nothing, I don't feel like there's anything that we really do that is necessarily um, difficult on its own, but just the combination of uh, making sure that uh, we're ordering products properly, that we're getting the right merchandise, that we're keeping track of our inventory and we're uh, juggling all of the the suits that our tailor might be altering for us and taking care of the customers after the sale. There's just a lot of moving pieces that, um, you know, as much as I would like to spend my time conceptualizing and, and working on building the brand and developing the concept, so much of our time as a team really goes into the the far less glamorous components of <laughs> of just taking care of our customers and and uh, making sure the store operates as as smoothly as we can as we can make it. Yeah. Oh, I meant to ask you, do you guys offer alterations? It, we have, we have a tailor who we've worked with for about three years. Um, and we're actually, we're, we're relocating our store, um, about a mile down the road to the, the, the trendy arts district in town. And when we move there, the tailor will actually do her work, uh, in the store as opposed to just, um, uh, you know, out, outside of the store. So, so that's a key component to us is, is, uh, you can buy a suit and we can get it altered so that it looks like it was custom made and you're not spending anywhere near the, the, uh, custom suit price. So now, um, we're just going to, um, ask you a few wrap up questions. Do you have a favorite podcast or blog? And if so, what is it? Oh boy. So, uh, there's a, there's a blog that I've always liked. Um, and it's, it's because I guess it's it's menswear specific, and uh, it's a little bit different part of the industry than us. But uh, it's called a continuous lean, and uh, it's focused on kind of the old world um, craftsman type menswear stores and menswear brands. But it's just kind of a very behind the scenes look at uh, the heritage of men's clothing and and some of the kind of innovators or people who are still out there. Uh, doing things uh, the old-fashioned way, so uh, it's not necessarily the the world that I live in, uh, but I I've developed an appreciation for the industry by uh, you know just living it the last four years. So uh, plus the the guy who writes it is an Ohio native, so I have a little affinity there too. So. <laughs> Got to support. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. It looks really cool. Yeah, we'll be sure to include it in the show show notes for everybody who's listening. If you could have any celebrity, entertainer, model, you name it, um, athlete, visit your mobile boutique, who would it be? Oh, man. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, let's see. So my my all-time hero, um, and he's, he's probably not part of my stated demographic these days, but my all-time hero is Bob Dylan. We 
we oh. are from the same corner of the world. Um, and we both grew up in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, and he's, he's a, a very interesting, innovative guy. I just saw him in concert for like the 15th time last week. So, uh, I think in general, um, he would be a guy we'd like to outfit in a suit and, and, uh, have a conversation with. Neat. And we're hoping one of these days someone is going to name someone and then we're going to get an email and they're going to be like, so-and-so came to our truck after listening to your podcast. (laughs) I'm just waiting for the day that happens. So I hope that happens for you. And if it does, let us know. (laughs) Well, we're pretty lucky being the menswear store near Ohio State's campus. Uh, Ohio State is kind of a pipeline for uh, a whole bunch of athletes who go on to do some pretty cool things. So we've been lucky to uh, even as kind of a, a young and, and new store to have some of uh, some of those folks who have Ohio state ties, who maybe came to us just out of an allegiance to us as Buckeyes. So uh, oh, that, that's as close as we've gotten so far, but, uh, but kind of cool when you're uh, when, when people who could afford to shop elsewhere will shop with you. That's, that's pretty neat. Yeah. That says a lot. <laughs> Um, so what do you like to do in your free time to wind down or just de-stress after coming home from work? Yeah, uh, I'm big into yoga. I'm not any good at it, but I love doing <laughs> it. Uh, and I find that's about the only time where I can remove myself from my cell phone long enough and not worry about, uh, checking emails or the phone ringing. So I enjoy that. Uh, I have a road bike so I can get out and, uh, get some fresh air and, and, get my blood pumping a little bit. And, uh, th- those two things are about the, you know, the, the exercise component that helps release some of the, uh, <laughs> the, the stress of being a small business owner. Um, yeah. and, and then I'm also, you know, I'm also a sucker for, for eating good food and, and maybe having a glass of wine, uh, to relax at the end of the night. So thankfully, uh, near us in Columbus, there's a lot of really great restaurants and places you can sit outside and have dinner and, and a glass of wine on a nice night. Oh, neat. And yeah, you guys have good weather right now too. It's been beautiful. Um, yeah. yeah, I know. And my husband is from Akron and I'm from Chicago. So we know like the kind of like Midwest weather could be unpredictable. <laughs> so he would have wanted me to say LeBron then? Would that Probably. Been, yeah. <laughs> we, we wouldn't be opposed to LeBron coming in either. So. <laughs> That probably is more realistic than Bob Dylan, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, right. but you never know. <laughs> um, Android or iPhone? And I, I think I know this because you have an iPhone 6 Plus, but what's your favorite app? So definitely, definitely iPhone. Everything, um, we've got an iMac on our desk in the store. I have a MacBook. Our checkout is a is an iPad. So Apple has gotten every dime out of me. I haven't bought a watch yet, but <laughs> otherwise <laughs> otherwise they've gotten everything out of us. Uh, we run our whole business on them. Uh, uh, favorite favorite app. Um well, there's there's a couple. So yeah. I'm definitely uh, an avid Instagrammer partially for the business and and uh, partially for myself, but I, lo- I love uh, to the point where sometimes my girlfriend yells at me because I'm we're on a walk and I'm taking pictures of everything. But <laughs> I, I, so I enjoy for fun. I enjoy Instagram. Um, I think for uh, the business, there's an app we use that um, maybe is a little bit specific to the way we, what we sell and and the process, but we use an app called Trello, which is kind of like a project mm. management app, but it's how we keep track of all the suits we sell and where they're at in the process of getting tailored or picked up and things like that. So, uh, that's, that's kind of the, uh, at the central nervous system of our business, as far as keeping track of, of everything we sell. So I like that one from a nerdy store owner perspective. Um, mm. But otherwise, you know, Instagram and and uh, the the new favorite is Snapchat. I'm, I'm, I am uh, trying to stay young by uh, <laughs> by getting in on Snapchat a little bit. So I know Estrella and I, we just were like, okay, we can't even do Snapchat. It's just too much. It was like I was like, we can't add another like social media account. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> um, 
But I will say Trello is nice. Uh, it's used, I think a lot of people don't know about it, except people who are kind of like in the design or developer community, because a lot of developers use it. Like even when I was um, working with this developer to do an app, we use Trello to keep track of things. Sure. So it's, I, I think it's an awesome app, especially if you have like a group of people you're working with and you're trying to keep track of things. And I was just going to say, you know, with the suits, I feel like you need an iWatch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just going to set everything off. <laughs> what well, do you work for Apple now, Nisha? Why are you pushing the watch? <laughs> kind of bad, right? And I won't even buy the watch. Like I was like, okay, Apple, I I can't. <laughs> yeah, it's it's more uh, it's more just I think I think I've uh, I've maximized the amount of my. Uh, my brain power throughout the day that can be dedicated to looking at something. And I'm really afraid that uh, that might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. It will take if I, over your life. If I'm also getting notifications on my wrist, um, I, I'm, I'm worried that, uh, that I'm just kind of getting adult attention deficit just because I'm, I'm constantly, uh, you know, it's, it's cool. You can, you can kind of run your whole business from a phone. That's pretty pretty amazing to me. I get a notification when I'm not in the store every time we sell something and, you know, we're using things like Trello and, you know, I'm talking to you on my phone with Skype now. So I can pretty much do everything with the business right through my phone. So I fear that the watch would just, I'd probably be looking <laughs> at that in yoga. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the final question is what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? Wow. That's deep. <laughs> you know, I have zero, I have zero musical abilities. Um, so I kind of wrote that off as never being a possibility, but I feel like, um, I, I feel like I would like to be some kind of performer. I, I like to get up and talk in front of people. So I feel like I would probably enjoy getting up and like singing and performing. So if, if I was guaranteed to somehow find the talent for that, I would be, I would be, uh, I think my ego would like uh, being able to get up on stage in front of an audience like that. No, I think that would be awesome. I remember because Astral and I went to high school together, and there were so many people that could sing. I was jealous <laughs> because oh my god! I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying. I was like, why didn't I get any voice? I used to tell my mom, I'm like, why didn't we get any kind of like musical anything? I can't even <laughs> hold a tune. So I completely understand where you're coming from because it's like I would just imagine like commanding the audience and just you know feeling i don't know just the the vibe from the the audience itself would would be amazing but you clearly have to have like musical talent to do that <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think for us we feel like the our creative outlet is the business so you know the thing that we're putting out there in the world is is this unique store and you know certainly the truck is a uh a very unique addition to that but it's it's kind of our creative outlet so uh we try to use pursuit um, we've actually done some video series with some athletes and some uh musicians and I, i've got a good friend i grew up with who's in a, tra a traveling and an indie rock band that's been extremely successful and i find myself uh you know when we're catching up uh, i find myself envious of the you know him traveling the world uh, <laughs> putting putting his thing out there, the music out there for for people all over the world to hear. So I kind of you know you draw some parallels between creating a brand and a, and a business and uh, and and being some kind of artist. So uh, yeah. I just don't have the talents for that other kind of art. So where can the audience find you? So we've got a few different ways you can connect with us. Uh, we like to we like to think we're the most interesting suit store on social media. So uh, if you're also addicted to your phone and you want to be on Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter and everything, we are at Pursuit Yourself on pretty much every social media there is, uh, including YouTube. We do a lot of educational content and stuff on YouTube. Um, we'd certainly love if people wanted to shop with us. You can do that from anywhere at pursuityourself.com. And we will uh, 
be revamping that site uh, again it'll be our third iteration of the site sometime in the middle of the summer so you can always check out what we're doing there and, and shop online wherever you are um, if you want to see the suit mobile we do a lot of things around ohio so you know we're based in columbus uh, the suit mobile there's a component of the website that uh, if we're on top of things we post our schedule of where we're going to be and then our brick and mortar store uh, kind of the the core of our business the the uh, the store itself is uh, at the moment at ohio state's campus in columbus and we'll actually be moving just a little bit down the road here soon so you can find us whenever you're in columbus we'll be uh we'll be seven days a week uh in the short north arts district our new address is 937 north high street in columbus so uh, depending on on uh, where you are, those are all the different ways you can follow along with us or come see us. Awesome. Well, thanks again for agreeing to be on this podcast. I think uh, future fashion truck owners and just um, people looking for a suit will will find it very interesting. So thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you doing this and connecting this whole world of people doing this strange thing that we're doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I mean, we kind of want our own truck now, but it's just like it's we can't even really fathom how we would pull it off trying to because we both have like full time jobs that's not related to find a fashion truck. Then we run find a fashion truck. Then how are we going to have time to run a fashion truck? Too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's not going to happen. It's crazy. <laughs> it's yeah, too and, many and social media accounts. We, we have a hard time finding time to run the suit mobile because we have a regular store. So <laughs> I certainly can relate. You know, our, our day job is, is the same product, but we're so wrapped up in growing you know the the core of our business is the store so uh we, we try to find time to use the truck too but can certainly relate to uh and we do have one friend here in columbus who has a women's uh focused boutique uh called a boutique truck and she has a full-time job um I believe she's at victoria's secret headquarters um and she does it in her free time and i i uh I'm impressed that that you can work a full time corporate job and then do something like this on the side too. Yeah, yeah there's several people doing it. It is. It's dedication. <laughs> but thanks again for your time. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I look forward to hearing it. Wow. I really enjoyed that interview with Nate. It's interesting. He brought up his success with YouTube. We didn't really get to go into it much, but um, for all you listeners out there, we're starting to do some YouTube videos also. So we put, even though they're audio only, all the podcast episodes on there, but we're going to try to do some um, of our business tips is actual videos. So if you haven't already, head on over to YouTube and just Google find a fashion truck and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel to check out um, some of our future videos. And men, listen to me. If you do not own a suit, please go out and get one. I know too many men that do not have one. And I'm going <laughs> to tell you, there is nothing sexier than a man in a well-fitting <laughs> suit. Oh, my God. <laughs> nothing sexier. <laughs> and I think it's kind of neat that they make it affordable for, like, especially um, college graduates that are about to get their first job. And they're going to need a suit so they don't have to spend 500 to to $1,000. It's under you know, like a $400 price point. So I think that's, that's great. Um, and I was just excited to hear how he built his brand. Cause sometimes people think success can happen overnight, but since 2011, I mean, he's done like, you know, the pop-up shop and then went into a brick and mortar and then online and then the fashion truck. And now he's doing his own line of suits. So it just kind of shows like if you stick to it with, you know, and be persistent, you know, you can really be successful. And I also thought another key point uh, in what he said was he created a business plan. So he he had like at least a good foundation and a good starting point for his business, um, which I think helped him uh, achieve success. So kudos to him. And everything was professionally done. The website, all of the branding, the photos look great. 
So that is key, people, when you're starting your business. It's understandable if it's not in your budget to have a professional photographer or um, a professional contractor do the build out for your truck or a professional web designer. You should figure out what your priority is and allocate the funds towards what you feel is going to make the biggest impact. But definitely, if you can go professional all the way, because that is going to help bring in customers. It's going to help build your audience because people are attracted to beautiful things. And we just, um, the episode before it, before this, what was that? Episode 12. (laughs) Um, We talk about, the title of it is everything, you can find everything on Google. But let's say if you're like, man, I can't afford a professional photographer. Well, you know, see if you can maybe take some affordable online classes for like $35. Five dollars or a hundred dollars, or even if you if you don't have that in your budget, maybe just start off small with watching like YouTube videos on how to use an SLR if you own one, or how to better use your Android or iPhone to take quality photos. So it's definitely a way to fake it till you make it, even if you don't have it in your budget to invest in it. But it was it was clear like if you go to his website, um, which is the PursuitYourself dot com. You can tell like everything was professionally done. And and even I think he said in the interview too, is like, hey, sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. So even if he wasn't able to afford everything in the beginning, it still looked very professional. So with that being said, we hope you enjoyed the interview. Don't forget to go to iTunes and subscribe to the podcast. Rate us and please leave us a review. We'd really appreciate it. And on um, Facebook and Instagram, you can find us at FFT underscore official underscore. If you're on Pinterest or Facebook, uh, just uh, search Find a Fashion Truck. All right. And we hope that this was very helpful. Look forward to seeing some of your comments on either Facebook or the show notes themselves. And uh, hope you have a wonderful day. All right. Bye. Thanks for parking here. Take care.